Welcome to the True Blue Riftcast. Oh my gosh. Sorry, guys. I'm just going to say this right now while I'm doing the intro in lieu of the intro. I am kind of sick right now. So this is going to sound a little rough on my side. Just just a poor warning. He almost died. He almost oh. died trying to intro it just a second ago, too. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure that's going to be on the outtakes for all the patrons. Yes. But uh, it was uh, it was pretty funny. Jeremy almost dying pretty was is, is pretty oh, hilarious. I'm... In my in my in, in my estimation, glad I was able to entertain you with that, Dave. I'm glad too. Thank you very much. I am Jeremy, and of course, I am joined as always by. Oh hi, I'm Dave. Uh, I'm amused by Jeremy di- by Jeremy dying. <laughs> uh, and uh, as Dave mentioned, that that's going to make good fodder for our patrons. And if you want to become a patron, you can head over to Patreon.com/slash True Blue Riftcast to sign up. Dave, how was your Thanksgiving? It was, it was, it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, I ate dinner, uh, and then I came down to my room and slept for like five hours. I didn't mean for that to happen. You, <laughs> you know, one of those naps that you don't know you're taking, and it's like a really awesome nap, and then suddenly you wake up and you realize, oh, it's seven o'clock. <laughs> yeah, that's what happened I've to done me that before. I like my family must have drugged me, and then like when I woke up, everyone had gone. So it was one of those. Did you go out on Black Friday and trample anybody for a good deal on the TV? No, I'm not gonna do that. Absolutely not. I mean, it's look. Here, here's the thing, man. This happens to me anytime I like go into like a Walmart or something. Or to like a store during December. Uh-huh. I'll need something, and I'll for, and I'll forget it's December. <laughs> like, oh, go in there, just get whatever the hell it is I need, right? And then the second I walk in, I'm like, oh crap, I forgot. Yeah, the lines like are half hour long, and yeah, yeah, it's uh, and it happens at least once every year that it's just like I walk in and it's oh crap, I forgot, and it's just madness. Yeah, speaking of madness. That's going to be one of the VODs we take a look at today, <laughs> thanks to our... Uh, As in Santa's Village of. Yes, thanks to our patrons. Uh, they voted on this between uh, Ice Cream Bunny, uh, Jack Frost, and Santa's Village of Madness. And we're going to be talking about Santa's Village of Madness coming up later. Also, today we are going to be taking a look at one of my favorite riffs, Samurai Cop. Yep, Samurai Cop. I'm not as good as Kevin, but that's a great song. <laughs> no, you I'm are not, not absolutely at all. But first, let's take a look at some headlines. Headlines. <laughs> well, sad news for Riff fans all over. Uh, Netflix did what they like to do the most, and they canceled the uh, revival of Mystery Science Theater 3000. After a mere season and a half, half, a half. Yeah, well, they only got six episodes for the gauntlet, as they called it. The good news, if uh, if you're mad at Netflix over this, you can buy the episodes either straight from mst3k.com, or you can buy them digitally through rifttracks.com. You can buy them uh, the episodes individually at like nine dollars piece for the HD files. Or you can buy the whole thing for like thirty something, and they work out to like six something a piece. Or you can go over and you can buy the Blu-rays uh, from Shout Factory or MST3K. It's basically the same thing anyway. And uh, yeah, you don't have to give Netflix any money for it. Well, chances are you're already giving Netflix your money, so I'm not giving Netflix anything. What? I canceled my Netflix last time they raised their prices. Well, which was, what, this past time? I know it's like $12 now. Yeah, the last time they raised it up again. We were just like, eh. There's nothing on there that we absolutely need to watch. Disney Plus was coming out, and we're like, well, that's all the kids are going to be watching. And Disney Plus is like 7 bucks. Yeah. It's like literally half. Yeah. Speaking of Disney Plus. Yeah, The Mandalorian. It's time for... Our our now uh, weekly dis- spoiler discussion of the Mandalorian. Uh, give yourself about ten minutes on the timeline here, and uh, maybe not quite that long for this week. Yeah, but, uh, 
just to be safe, give yourself about 10 minutes. And if you overshoot the beginning of uh, our talking about Samurai Cop, then you can just wind it back a little bit. But So this week on The Mandalorian, uh, the show turned into uh, Seven Samurai. Yeah, it's a little weird. We open up and there are like all these blue fishes. Blue shrimps. Yeah, blue shrimp. And uh, they're like these mud farmers where they like, I guess they like have all these tiny little stock ponds full of blue fish that they farm and then these uh dog aliens come out and they don't really kill any of the villagers but what they do is they force them all to hide like you know like in the water while they steal the harvest yeah they they raid their village and you hear like these thundering steps and uh when my son and i were watching it we looked at each other and i turned to him and i said i bet that's an ats see yeah and it turns out I was right. Yeah, that's weird. It, 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 yeah, that's that's exactly what happens. And then, of course, you know, The Mandalorian, which is, I guess this one's called, like, the whatever, find whatever the chapter is. This name one is. was called uh, Sanctuary. Ah, that makes sense. So Mandalorian, not Boba Fett, and Baby Yoda come in, and Baby Yoda's doing all this hilarious Baby Yoda stuff <laughs> on the uh, on the ship. And they go in, and they're like, and not Boba Fett says, okay, now I want you to stay here in the ship. Don't get out or follow me. And what's Baby Yoda to do? Is he, he, follows he just walks him, out. He's just like, walks out ah, screw it. I got no control over this baby alien. Screw it. You know? <laughs> yeah. And amazingly, Baby Yoda is able to keep up with it. Yeah. Uh, and then they walk in like this, uh, this restaurant. He orders some bone broth for uh, Baby Yoda. And he notices uh, somebody sitting over in another booth. Yeah, this jacked up chick, yeah. And he's like, hey, how long has she been here? And the waitress is like, I don't care. And he looks and she's gone. So he gets up and he and he goes after her, pays the uh, server to watch Baby Yoda. And uh, he goes out to follow this woman. And, they end and up she, no, 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 and... no, no. There was not a fight. She kicked his ass. I was like, what? Like, like, and he's fully armored and he, and she's just punching him in the face. Like, like it's nothing. <laughs> yeah. He, uh, he doesn't, he doesn't fare very well against her. No, but I, I just wanted to, I just wanted everybody to know that, uh, I think her name's Kara just kicked the Mandalorian's ass. I mean, just <laughs> like, I mean, it wasn't a draw. I mean, she just wailed on him. And then... Uh, and she didn't even think anything about it. She's like, no. yeah, screw it. I'll just beat this guy up. Doesn't matter. And then they they hear something, and they look over, and there's Baby Yoda with his little cup of bone broth just taking a sip and watching him fight. And that kind of calms him down. Like, what you doing? And uh, then we find out that they have a history with each other, and they end up having a chat, seeing what, you know, what the other person's been up to. And they get recruited to protect this little uh village where they they farm these blue uh, i think they said they were krill blue krill and uh yeah they go and And let's talk about just for a second how much of coward jerks these people are to begin with (laughs) they're very manipulative yeah no it's just be like oh i can't believe we have to go all the way back to the middle of nowhere and we can't defend ourselves, and it's going to be terrible, and this and that. And it's just like, dude, grow some balls, you know? It's Guilt them into helping, and they go and... Uh, Basically, yeah. There, There's a little bit of a moment with the Mandalorian and this widow that's there. Oh, yeah. And she she was one of the people we see in the intro um, hiding under the basket in the water with her kid. And uh, he helps him and uh, Cara Dune... Uh, decide to help kind of train these people to fight. Oh, well, first they find the ATST. Yeah. yeah, they find the ATST and they're like, uh, this isn't going to work. <laughs> did they ever explain, did they ever explain how the thing got there? No. Okay. No, they did not. Uh, but yeah, they tell, they tell the people in this little village that, uh, there's no way. They're like, yeah, we can't stop this thing. You know, we've seen these things wipe out entire battalions before. And they're just like, well, we don't care. We're going to stand and fight. You know, our our great grandparents. The Ewoks beat a whole bunch of them. 
our our great grandparents seeded this farm, and this is all we have, and we're going to stand our ground, you know, much like in uh, the Seven Samurai or Magnificent Seven or any other Western, really, where they get roped into helping somebody, and uh, they they teach them how to fight, they give them pointy sticks, and they teach them how to use blasters, and the widow kind of starts getting a thing for the Mandalorian. And uh, she, it shoots the crap out of a pan. Yeah. She's like, bing, 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 bing. So there's obviously something going on with her that we don't know about. And she asks him right before the big fight, you know, like the day before or whatever, if she can show him something inside. Oh, no. But then he's like, nah, I'm good. Yeah. We got to get ready. She is, he is, he's just like, no, friend zone. Yes. And uh, so the night falls and the bandits come and they, well, no, they go, they go and they bomb one of their, yeah. they come back and they're like, all right, they're coming. And they're trying to lure the, the scout walker into the uh, krill pond because it'll step in and it'll fall over because, you know, those things fall over at, at a strong, a strong breeze. But so they, they come in and the Raiders attack and the thing stops right at the edge of the krill pond. Yeah, and I just so realized, like, oh, Karen's look, decided. I think I might fall in this hole. I won't step into it. Yeah. So, it, like, it's an upgrade from the ATSTs that were on Endor. Because they'll be like, oh, I'll just walk over all these logs put up by these teddy bear people. You know? Yeah, so she takes uh, the Mandalorian's pulse rifle and she goes into one of the krill ponds and she's trying to lure it in closer to her. And uh, the leader of the bandits comes running in and the two manipulative uh, little farmers uh killing like they just off them i thought they were both gonna get killed right there but no they took care of business yeah and, none uh, of the villagers died yeah yeah not one of them did and uh of course they they lure the atst falls over the rest of the bandits run away and the mandalorian decides the next day or a couple days later or whatever that uh he's gonna leave baby yoda there and take off Oh, Ned, as, no, look, if that happens, then there's no more show. You don't know? No. Right. And then you see uh, somebody with one of the bounty hunter uh, low jack things, and he's, you know, it's beeping in the woods, and he pulls up his sniper rifle, and he's aiming it as, at the Mandalorian, and the widow is reaching, and she's starting to take off his helmet, and he grabs it, pulls it back down, like, no, he's like, nah. I'm leaving, I'm leaving don't do this. And then the, the bounty hunter guy puts the crosshairs on baby Yoda and you hear a shot. And of course it was Kara behind the bounty hunter. She killed him first before he could off baby Yoda. And she's like, yeah, it's not safe here. Now that they know you're here, they're just going to keep coming. Derp. So he gets on the wagon with the baby Yoda and uh, heads off back toward the ship. Now we do find out in this episode uh, what the ramifications are for taking your helmet off around somebody else. Uh, basically, he's honor bound not to ever put it back on. Yeah, so uh, what I got from that is that he's basically not a Mandalorian anymore. Right. And he kind of, I don't think he is anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, because he was just some kid that somebody found. From That's what I'm taking from it. Obviously, we don't know. You know, the backstory, if they were Mandalorian refugees, you know, that they ran off during the purge or whatever, we don't really know. And I'm sure we'll find that out um, either in this season or the next, which they've already started filming. Uh, but, yeah, I really like this this show. It's it's people are not fighting about this show. You're right. They're not. People aren't fighting about it. That's amazing. The the fan base is not split on this show. I really hope that carries over into the movie. The, we It won't. We know it won't. Yeah. We're not going to go into that again. Instead, we are going to take a look at the weekend box office. Of course, the number one movie, Frozen 2. Uh, it had like the highest uh, Thanksgiving you know, ever for a movie. Frozen 2. Oh, God. Frozen is 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 Frozen two like Baby Ghost? No, it's not. No Baby Ghost. <laughs> oh, I just want everything to be Baby Ghost. The number two movie, uh, Knives Out, which is uh, one that I've been hearing a lot of good things about, and I'm kind of interested to go see. Uh, 
Third place, Ford versus Ferrari. A beautiful day in the neighborhood at number four. And some movie that I never heard of, Queen and Slim at number five. Because of that movie, everybody now knows that Tom Hanks and Mr. Rogers are related. Yeah, they're like sixth cousins or something. Yep. They found that odd in like Ancestry.com or some <laughs> crap. <laughs> yeah. But let's go now into our first VOD of the day. Let's talk about Samurai Cop. Samurai Cop. So Samurai Cop uh, has, a, has a very special place in, uh, in bad movie history. Yes. And um, uh, it's... I must before we go on. I'm 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 ashamed to say that I had never heard of this movie before it was a riff tracks. Just putting that out there. Ah, yeah, that's fine. It you don't want to watch you don't want to watch the full version of it by itself. And I say full version because there were a couple scenes that were cut out for the riff. Yeah, yeah. Oof. But Samurai Cop was long, uh, one of the most requested movies that riff tracks do you know that they that they take on and in fact it's one of the uh i believe only three non-live show releases that they've ever done a pre a pre-order for right um samurai cop miami connection and uh dave you said the wizard yes the you, wizard you was the one in 2015 i do remember that uh yeah you have the two biggest riff tracks fans in the world i believe we can't those... remember <laughs> yeah if there had been any other pre-orders, I don't believe there have been. Yeah, I think those are the only three. But yeah, Samurai Cop is—he's uh... on loan from San Diego, <laughs> there in Los Angeles. Yes, um, and he trained with the uh, High Masters in Japan to become a samurai, even though there's nothing samurai about him. Yeah, uh, except they have a sword fight at the end with Robert Zadar, but we'll we'll get into that. Um, <laughs> one of the main things about this about this movie is that the movie, the guy who directed it, is kind of an idiot. Um, <laughs> he uh, kind of they did principal photography. Yeah, they did principal photography at one point, and then the actor who never thought he was going to act again went and cut all his hair off, and the director said, "Oh, I need to do some reshoots." Uh, the actor's like, well, I don't have any hair. And it's like, oh, no, screw it. Let's just go get, let's just go to the wig store yeah. and get a baseball cap. We'll put a share wig on you. It's definitely noticeable. Yeah. You can tell when it's his actual hair and when it's not his actual hair. Mm -hmm. He, he is a cop who, as Dave said, is on loan, uh, from San Diego. He's from a different department and he comes up to help with this, uh, crime boss who's taking over the city right um even though he does respect the japanese of this country he's i'm gonna say some gigantic racist crap anyway yeah <laughs> uh one of the <laughs> there there's just so much about this movie that i absolutely love um i had watched this before the riff was announced and i knew that it was going to be amazing as soon as Rift Tracks got a hold of it. We'll we'll talk about this. I keep getting ahead of myself. <laughs> okay, so there's there's a Japanese a Japanese gang. Uh they call themselves the Katana and they're taking control of like all the cocaine stuff in Los Angeles. Which is quite a feat, by the way. I mean Yeah. They bring in Joe Marshall, uh who they call Samurai and uh they they're using him to to help take down this Japanese uh, crime family because he has been trained by the masters in Japan and he speaks fluent Japanese. Mm -hmm. I know he never really does in the movie. No, no, he doesn't speak any Japanese. I don't think one of the first things that we see him as a part of is they're, they're trying to stop the handoff of drugs. And so they're watching a Marina. Mm hmm there's a van that they're following and there's a boat that the helicopter is following. So there's a van. Okay. So, okay. So let's just start. There's, 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 there's a boat, a helicopter, a van and the car in this scene. Yeah. They're, they're crappy car that they're following them around in. Yes. And they follow the van out in the car 
and there's a lot of times where he's he's supposedly driving the car right but if you watch him while he's like turning the wheel his hands are just sliding along the wheel and the wheel itself is not actually moving kind of like how kids pretend they're driving cars yeah it was that it was basically that and uh he's yelling at his partner to shoot him shoot him shoot him shoot and him they literally they shoot a guy out of the back of the fan because they the you know the drug runners open up the back and of course you know they've got their guns and and they, they sh- <laughs> his partner frank uh shoots a guy he falls out of the van and they run him over <laughs> uh they end up chasing him into like this it's like a sand dune or something yeah and uh they they chase the van until the van crashes and it barely touches anything and it explodes and the guy comes running out of the van and he's on fire and uh they they put out the fire um uh, joe calls up to the helicopter and uh makes i don't know how they can hear him because he's just standing there outside of his car not anywhere near his radio um but sh- the the pilot can hear him clearly up there and he says it's always hot and ready or whatever and and uh and then what you don't see in the rift tracks version is there's a slam cut right to him and the the pilot having sex oh gosh uh, like so... just bam it's just right there and yeah so thankfully that's one of the scenes that they cut instead we get the uh the crime boss and uh he's he's yelling at the guys because one of their people got captured and so he sends Robert Zadar as uh, his, I guess he's his right hand man. His yeah. name is Yamashita. <laughs> yeah, right. that's that guy's name. They send him to the hospital to go take care of this guy. And he hides somehow this big giant Robert Zadar hides in this little laundry porter basket. This, the, Robert Zadar. Okay. Anybody listening to this podcast is going to know who Robert Zadar is. Can you imagine? I mean, just. Robert Zadar is not a small person. No. By any stretch. No, he's like, a big fan. And the idea that that lady was pushing that guy around in like that garbage can covered by a white <laughs> sheet. Oh, this isn't conspicuous at all. Oh, and they got by the crack security team. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The idiot uh, beat cop that's just sitting there. Yeah. You know, they tell him, don't let anybody into the room. And she's like, I got to take the garbage. And he's like, oh, all right. <laughs> Duh. They go in and uh, she pulls the sheet off the top of it. Here's Robert Zadar crouched down and he stands up and he pulls out his sword and he very gently begins to slice the man's head off like he's carving a fine Easter ham. Like it's just this really nice slow motion and you kind of hear this gurgling. And it's a really nice clean cut though. Oh yeah, perfectly, perfectly straight. (laughs) because <laughs> he has to take the head back to prove to his boss that he killed the guy. He, well, he wants his head on this piano. The, you know, the cops chase him. They can't get him. He escapes because he gets in the back of, like, a Fiero and pulls out, like, a Mac 10 and starts, like, you know, shooting at him when they, as they drive away. And we see uh, Joe goes to this restaurant where the the crime boss is. Joe and his, uh, and his, uh, and his partner, by the way. Joe and Frank. Yeah. Uh, This is after they get chewed out by the chief from the first thing. (laughs) The chief is something. This this whole movie is just like a wide variety of just awesome characters. Like the chief is like this rage-fueled maniac. Yeah. Captain Roma. I think he might be the most rage-filled character in the history of Riff Tracks. Like, I've never seen anybody get angrier. No. Like, and he just wants, he, he, he just, he, he just wants Samurai Cop dead. Yeah. His, his best line in the whole movie. Oh, no. Oh, this. They ask him if he's okay. And he's like, I feel like I have a club up my ass and it hurts. But, uh, Joe and, uh, Frank, they, they, they confront the katana at, uh, Carlos and Charlie's restaurant and, uh, we have the wonderful waiter there. The Mater D. And I'm not even going to try and say his full name. <laughs> yeah, he's uh, he's quite the character. <laughs> yeah, he uh, 
<laughs> That's all that can be said about him. He's my favorite part of the movie. He's he's just credited as a Costa Rican waiter. Costa Rica. Because oh. apparently whoever whoever did all that didn't feel like trying to type in his whole name either, uh, because it's this big, long, really fast. You know. Anyway, he goes in and he he confronts uh, Okamura. I think it's Okamura. I don't know. I can't keep any of these characters straight. Okamura Okamura's is, the ball guy. Yeah, Okamura is the henchman that gets killed in his underwear. <laughs> Fujiyama. That's the that's the leader. He uh Fuji Fujiyama. He confronts him and uh gives us another great line about how uh I'm telling all these son of a bitches. Surprisingly enough, that is that is correct. Son of a bitches? It is considered to be not a sons of saying, bitches. Right? No. Surprisingly enough, because that's what I thought. Okay. But anyway, they 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 leave and uh, they attack him in the parking lot, <laughs> where uh, where Joe With chops off grenades. Yeah, Joe crap, chops yeah. off one of the henchmen's arms uh, in a very hilarious fashion. Uh, Robert Zadar pulls out his little machine gun and starts killing his own people and just just spraying every car in the parking lot with bullets. And then he chucks a grenade and walks away. And then uh, Joe decides to go after Fujiyama's girlfriend, who he then has sex with. And then, uh. Yeah. But the uh, the Katana gang goes around and they start killing off um, some of the police officers that are a part of this squad trying to take them down. Uh, they go into this one officer's house and uh, grab his wife and uh, they rip open her her. I think she's wearing a robe and uh, what? Oh, they get very creepy oh, there. And no, no, no. They actually they actually show it in the full version. And uh, it's it's very uncomfortable to watch. And then they slice her throat and then they kill the kill him. And uh, they find the female officer that. Uh, was piloting the helicopter and they're trying to find Joe and she's cooking and Robert Zadar rips her shirt open and pours whatever the hot boiling liquid is on the stove on her. Yeah. Anyway, after these officers all start getting killed, Captain Roma actually says, you know what? Just go kill him. Yeah. <laughs> Just go kill uh, all, everybody in this gang. Yeah, and then we're all going to retire and, you know, go to yeah. hell. Joe and Frank go to the compound, and uh, they kill all of the all of the gang members. And there's the final fight between... Except the lead guy. Yeah, except for Fuji Fujiyama. Yeah, the one guy they're going after, the guy that matters, they don't kill him. Yeah. Joe and Yamashita have their big showdown where they are fighting with swords at first. In a clearly sped up footage, and then they they drop the swords and they just fight each other, and then the movie ends with Joe and uh, Jennifer, that's Fujiyama's girlfriend's name, um, consummating their relationship once. Again. <laughs> the end. The end. Uh... We have gotten two different versions of this riff. We had a uh, a standard studio VOD. And then after that, uh, I think it was the next year, right? We had the live show. Yeah, it was 2017. Yeah, yeah. It was it was released in I think March of 2016 as the VOD, and then in uh, a little over a year later, they uh, did the live show version. Yeah, yeah. It was it was uh, March 2016. Either way, you decide to watch it, the the standard version or the live show. If you haven't seen it before, you're gonna have a good time. Um, and like I say, you don't have to worry about the nudity. There is definitely a lot of uh, adult language in this one. There are no gorilla grabs in this. No, yeah. no, yeah. They, there's a lot of language and there's, you know, violence. It's very fakey, but if either of those things, you know. So don't watch it around any small children, probably. Yes. Now, uh, the next one we could definitely watch with small children. <laughs> Yeah, this next one. So this was the winner of our last patron poll. Uh, you got to choose between Jack Frost, Santa, and the Ice Cream Bunny, and Santa's Village of Madness, which uh, admittedly Dave and myself both wanted to win the poll. And it did. You listened to us again. 
and we greatly appreciate it. <laughs> and uh, so now we get to talk about the K. Gordon Murray masterpieces that uh, were assembled into Santa's Village of Madness. Now, this one is basically three short films put together. There's uh, Santa's Village. There's Santa and his helpers. And uh, Santa's Magic Kingdom are the three different uh, shorts for this. Well, they're all kind of the same, though. They mm-hmm. are They are definitely very, very similar. In fact, some of them reuse footage from others. Now, this was... Uh, these were made by Kate Gordon Murray, and he used footage from Santa Claus, the one that we talked about last week, and he made some new footage at the Santa's Village theme parks. There were a couple in California and one in Dundee, Illinois, and he went and he shot some footage, and it it very much has that same feel with the Santa and the Ice Cream Bunny. Yeah, that- with uh, with that part of it the stuff that were shot on location. That's the ice cream bunny actually shows up. Well, kind of. Um, but again, we'll, we'll get to that. Uh, yeah. Now this one is different than most VODs. Also in the fact that we get kind of, uh, we get like three host segments where it's, it's Mike, Kevin and Bill sitting around a table. They kind of do like a, a talk and riff tracks in between each. Oh, yeah, I was going to say, this is one of the very few riff tracks where we actually see Mike, Kevin, and Bill on screen. And it's it's kind of nice. They give a little bit of an intro. They kind of, uh, you know, talk about some of the stuff that we saw in the previous one, and then they, they give an intro for the next one. Our first our first one in this, uh, it's just called Santa's Village, right? Mm-hmm. Like, that's the first, that's the first uh, short film. And in this, we are introduced, you know, of course, they, they recap how... Santa lives in his uh, castle high above the North Pole, and he gets around using the fifth dimension that Merlin the wizard found, and it allows him to go anywhere at any time. Yeah, Merlin, the, yeah, it's ridiculous. So where does he go? He goes to one of his many workshops located around the world, a.k.a. Santa's Village uh, theme parks. That's basically, these are advertisements for the theme parks. I mean, let's be real here. Yeah. Because they show a bunch of the different buildings. They show how each one has a North Pole. And this is where we are introduced to Stinky the Skunk. My favorite, but that doesn't come till much later. And it's got nothing to do with Santa's Village. Of <laughs> Stinky the Skunk goes up and he decides he's going to eat the uh, the North yeah. Pole. <laughs> like these, a dead puss in boots comes up and it's just like now well what do you think you're doing i'm eating this ice cream now (laughs) you know that ice cream break ended more than 10 minutes ago it's like (laughs) what is happening (laughs) what is going on and then we go into one of the workshops where we see the ferocious wolf who's like the foreman and He's aggravated because he looks terrible, for one thing. Oh my, oh sir! Yes, the famous Christmas wolf in his catchphrase, "Oh my, oh sir!" He decides. Oh my, oh sir! He decides he needs to go find Stinky the Skunk because he hasn't seen him in a while and he needs to get some work done. And uh, as he walks around, um, he has his own theme song, which they said is basically his own version of Torgo's theme song. And it's uh, it's like someone's murdering an accordion. Uh, let's say Weird Al having a bad acid trip. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty bad. It's <laughs> very <laughs> yeah. It's just that's like every time he walks in this first one, it does that. Uh, Stinky the skunk is in a little theater where they're doing a puppet show, and all the kids are like backing away from him because he smells so bad obviously because he this guy the wolf sneaks in holding a branch over his face he starts yelling at stinky to get back to work we had toys to make ah my old son and then all the children are like <laughs> why is this happening wonderful <laughs> and then uh they they all get back to work and we see this one kid trying to make a doll and the head keeps falling off and uh, Stinky is, like, sharpening ice skates. Uh-huh. Like, totally something that 
you know, somebody in a in a giant furry costume should be trying to do. Sparks flying everywhere and and uh, all that and and that's that's basically it for the first one. The second one is just kind of like this kind of weird tour and it's um it's where we run into the ice cream bunny or at least something that looks a lot like the ice cream bunny. And this is one of my favorite moments in all of Rift Tracks is when the ice cream bunny in the train comes around and is revealed and you hear Mike, Kevin and Bill and you can you can tell that you know they're genuine in their reaction when they're they're surprised to see the ice cream bunny. It's just like, "Whoa!" <laughs> Like what the hell? He's everywhere. The, yeah, it's it's the train at Santa's Village being driven by this giant rabbit. So like, oh my god, it's the ice cream bunny all over again. Uh surprisingly enough, that costume actually looked halfway decent though. <laughs> Honestly, probably one of the better looking ones in this whole thing. And right after this, we get to see the ferocious wolf uh, berating stinky the skunk as he's like on patrol or something with this giant sniper rifle with a huge bayonet on the end of it and he's just smacking stinky in the head and telling him he's worthless and he smells bad and puss in boots walks up and tries to uh to calm down the wolf. Like... that's not very nice and you know he can't help the smell and then they all start talking at the same time yeah and then Puss starts berating Stinky. He just tells the wolf that he can't help how he smells because he's a skunk. And then he starts yelling at Stinky because he smells so bad. And they're just yelling at each other, and it's madness. And then Santa shows up, and he's like, oh, 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 oh. get back to work. Santa's just not a great person in, the, in this one, I gotta say. No. No, he's not. Like, he convinces them to go back to work, and then we get the exact same footage as in Santa's Village of the kid trying and failing to put the doll together, and the head keeps falling off, and Stinky the Skunk is sharpening skates again, and Santa's looking through one of those uh, double doors, and just, ho, 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 the end. Yeah. Like, ho, ho, ho. <laughs> my name is Ozzy Mandius. Oh, look on my work, she mighty in despair. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> I mean, it might have, might as I well know. have been. And then we go on to the third one, the third and final one here, Santa's Magic Kingdom. And no, this isn't a look at Disney World, but this is, in fact, a lot of footage from the Santa Claus movie. It actually starts off uh, showing all of the kids that were trapped in his castle in the Santa Claus movie, uh, making all the toys in the workshop up there. Because screw continuity, let's just make it be that all of his helpers are at at his castle above the North Pole now. And he goes to Merlin and, you know, he has Merlin send him down. And Merlin's just this doddering old. Well, it's it's Merlin from the from the movies. And they they send Santa down to yeah. one of his many villages, where uh, of course we see Stinky and the ferocious wolf, and then we find out that the large rabbit driving the train is actually the Easter Bunny. Uh, I call it BS. That's the ice cream bunny. We we start getting introduced to some other uh, fairy tale land ish characters, uh, and then we find out that there's an ogre coming, and head of security Puss in Boots has to try and fend it off. And it somehow ends with everybody just kind of gathered around outside one of the workshops singing a song. Yeah, it doesn't like Glinda, the the Good Witch of the North, show up or or like the uh, Fairy Snow Queen or whatever. Yeah, like the Good Fairy or something, whatever she was supposed to be. Mr. B Natural or Guardiana comes up. (laughs) <laughs> it's it's not important enough to actually pay attention to the real story of what's going on here. Now, I want to mention this because this movie is available on DVD or as a VOD. If you buy it on DVD, you actually get four other shorts with it. Ooh, what are they? Three of these shorts you can purchase as separate VODs. One of them is the absolutely insane Join Hands Let's Go. Uh, we have uh, Aesop's Frozen Fables, 
and then we have uh, the magic shoes. Now, the fourth one you can only get on this DVD, and it's called What's Happening. It's another Encyclopedia Britannica short, and it just is a it's it's a, just a series of events there's no talking there's no dialogue in this whatsoever and there seems to be no point to it either now the other interesting thing about this short is there's another version of the short that Rift Tracks did Ooh. that was only available as a digital goodie to one of the live shows Santa Claus Conquers the Martians and it's the What's Happening Musical Edition. And in this one, um, Mike and Bill, or I'm sorry, Mike and Kevin are riffing the short. But every time anybody says What's Happening, Bill starts the What's Happening theme song. And he sings it literally through the entire short. That's all Bill does in this version, is he just sings the What's Happening theme song. <laughs> And that's funny. So, you know, it's kind of a special thing. So if you're thinking about getting this one, I would suggest getting the DVD, at least if you're a completionist on things like like Dave and myself here, um, because that's the only way to get that particular short. And as far as the musical edition right now, it's you know, you can't you can't get it anywhere. But I I uh, I have heard that it might eventually show up on like a shorts DVD or something. K Gordon Murray has done some other uh, interesting little, little films, or at least licensed uh, them, bought them from, from Mexico and uh, re narrated and retranslated them or whatever. Uh, and one of those is one of my personal favorites of all time. It's called, it's this, I don't know. We we might have talked about it on the podcast before. We might have talked about it last week, but I just want to talk about it again because it's just so wonderful. <laughs> it's this little movie called Little Red Riding Hood and the Monster. Yes. And it features much better versions of at least Stinky and the uh, Ulcer Wolf. <laughs> it, it doesn't matter what the story is, but there comes a point in the movie, and th- this is what's most important. Is that uh, the uh, Little Red Riding Hood? Stinky's hang, Stinky hangs out with Little Red Riding Hood, okay? And it's the same voice actor. I mean, I don't know if it's the same voice actor, but it's definitely the same Stinky. This is Stinky from, but it, it's a much better, higher quality version of it. And he's hanging out with uh, Little Red Riding Hood. And there are these children, and there's like this kidnapper that's like after them for the bad guy. And they, uh, the kids are in this bag. Yeah, I think it's one of the ogres. Yeah. The kids are in this, the kids are caught up in this bag. And Stinky and uh, Red Riding Hood free them from the bag. And they're like, oh, hey, look, there's our kidnapper. And Stinky is like, let's go tie him up. Like, da 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 da. Like, and they go, and the, the kids rush him and mob him. And Stinky is just like, oh, it's time to murder. Like, no, literally, it's to be like, I, like a good old fashion. Like, like he's like, I'm getting a rope, and I, like, I just love tie. I'm, I'm not even kidding. Like, he, he sings songs of joy about like tying knots to like hang people up for like a lynching. And then Little Red Riding Hood has to talk sense into these children. Like, hey, let's not yeah. murder. And Stinky is just like. Oh, but I just like just love killing so much, and he's still a good guy. That's about it. It's amazing. It'll it'll change your thinking of Stinky the Skunk forever. <laughs> uh, my theory about about why Stinky looks better is because that was when that costume was still new, and uh, before he before K. Gordon Murray bought it from them to use later in these uh, things, and I would imagine that it just he didn't clean it. You know, it probably smelled like B.O. and uh, mothballs or something at that point. <laughs> like the ferocious wolf, it looks like it's falling apart. <laughs> like the jaw is just kind of hanging there and it's off to the side a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's just like, it's like the costume is broken. One other interesting detail about K. Gordon Murray, if you happen to uh, have taken part in this year's Cyber Monday sale, which is going on now while we're recording, but obviously will be done by the time it goes up, then you would have gotten 
a short called Mother Goose's Birthday Party with Ronald McDonald. Now, why this is important and why this ties in with this uh, is this K. Gordon Murray. He made it, and it has Puss in Boots and Stinky the Skunk and all of these characters that he uses in uh, Santa's Village of Madness. And they show up with Ronald McDonald. So weird. Now, this is just a, a short glimpse of the full thing. It's only like the first like four or five minutes or so. And uh, once again, I do have word that uh, this... If it shows up for sale at a later date, uh, it'll probably be with either another short or, again, on a DVD, you know, like a collection of shorts or something, or as a bonus Mm -hmm. feature, a bonus short, like they like to do with some of the movies. That's going to do it for us this week. Our next patron poll uh, will be going up, of course, on Thursday and replacing Santa's Village of Madness is something else just as terrible and it's a uh, Christmas circus with Wizzle the Clown. Yeah, and we're not going to influence this one. I just decided we're uh, we're just going to let you guys figure it out, <laughs> and we'll do it. So, what is it? It's Jack Frost, Ice Cream Bunny, and Wizzo, right? Yep, that's correct. That's quite the triple threat. So oh, let's yeah. see who dukes it out. Any any of these are are going to be fun to talk about. So, you know, we're not going to try and steer you towards anything uh, at all this time. We'll hash it out. But until then, I'm Jeremy. You can find me at pbandawesome.com. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube at pbandawesome. You can send me emails, jeremy at trueblueriffcast.com. You can follow the podcast at tbriffcast, and you can become one of our patrons at patreon.com slash trueblueriffcast. And I'm Dave Chadwick, a.k.a. Sugar Ray Dodge. You can check me out on the web at sugarraydodge.com. You can send me emails at dave at trueblueriffcast.com. And that's going to do it. We will see you guys next week here on the True Blue Riffcast.